a quick review of the etymology and the summarization of what we just looked at. <clears throat> Modern English Jesus derives from early Middle English Isu, attested from the 12th century. The name participated in the great vowel shift. These are key words, and when you're researching all of this, you'll see these words will crop up in antiquity. The great vowel shift in the late Middle English 15th century. The letter J was the first distinguished was first distinguished from I or E as it was pronounced by the Frenchman Pierre Ramos in the 16th century. So the English language did not have a letter J until the 16th, 16th century. It is the most recent addition to our alphabet. So how could his name be Jesus? But did, but did not become common in modern English as a whole thing. Something new comes in, people don't jump on it straight away, books not change straight away, it takes time. So until the 17th century, 17th century AD, that's pretty recent as far as history goes. Really recent. You might as well say yesterday. The letter J came into being. So that early 17th century works, such as the first edition of the King James Bible in 1611, continued to print the name with an I, not a J. It wasn't accepted. So to all of my brothers and sisters out there who say, his name is Jesus, how could it be? It's nonsense. I won't even go as far as to say, oh, I've been told the name Jesus is the new name given to the church. It's the name that the Jews call him Yeshua, the church calls him Jesus. That's the name that was given to us through our Bibles. That's the name that God gave to us. Poppycock. Nonsense, to put it in a very English way. So, from the Latin, the English language takes the forms Jesus from the nominative form Yesu. And if you go to Africa and many parts of the world, people still say Yesu. Muslims will say we we'll recognize Yesu. That's how far the Hellenization has gone. And what I said to you before about colonization and Hellenization, I was in the great, the great job in Greco Romanizing the whole world. And the Romans simply just absorb all things Greek. So, Yesu lingers in some and more archaic texts. Petrus Ramus. Now, to all my conspiracy people, your ears should have gone up at that point. Petrus Ramus. Have you heard that word before? I'm not seeing your face, but yeah. <laughs> Talking about the last poem. So, it's, is it coincidence that? Petrus Ramos, a Frenchman, uh, Pierre de la Lame, and the size of Peter, Peter Ramos, in other words, it means Peter of Rome in English. In the 15th, uh, 15th uh, century, was an influential French humanist, a uh, logician, an educational reformer, a Protestant convert. He was killed during the Second World War, they massacred him. Petrus Ramos is written about extensively by a man called Tom Horn. You'll read all about the prophecies of the last pope. I'll leave that one alone because if I see Petros Ramos, my ears pop up. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that sounds too familiar to Petros Ramos. Hmm, is there a conspiracy here to create a letter and a name? Is what I'm going with this. To take the people to somewhere, and I'll show you where we're meant to go. In fact, we're already there. 1611 King James Bible uses Isus throughout, regardless of syntax. I'll clarify what I just talked about in a few minutes, you'll see. So, with the new official English pronunciation of the name Jesus, the last remaining sound found in the name Yeshua, the U as in Sun, Yahushu, Yahu, Shuba, sound had vanished. Nothing in his name, Yahu, remains recognizable in either the sound or the meaning of the name, Yeshua. It should also be pointed out that the word Christ is not a name, but a title. I was a child, I grew up in the name of Jesus Christ. But it's not. <laughs> Christ is a title. The word Christ existed long before Christ came on the scene. There were many Christs. Many of the Pharaohs said they were Christ. It is basically a Greek translation of the 
title Messiah, which means an one. So all that is left of the sweet, gentle name of Yeshua, the Messiah, is the series of phonetically harsh sounds, Jesus Christ, which no doubt has lent its name to the abuse of suffering. The name Jesus Christ is commonly used in cursing. Because Jesus is the name used to refer to the Son of God. And godless men hate him. There are a few languages outside of English in which his name is used in a similar cursing manner. No other language renders the Lord's name in the phonetic harshness as does the English language. One exception would be the near identical way Christ is pronounced in French. And interestingly enough, it too is regularly used in French cursing. So considering the indisputable fact that, that for nearly 1,500 years after you show the earth, the world never heard the name Jesus. I can only conclude that the English version of his name is abused solely because of its harsh sound. Remember the name Jesus has only been in existence, in existence for 400 years, for a few hundred years, sorry. So the Latin suffix, sus, when translated into English, means pig. It's when you get the English word sound. So let that one go. The Latin word sus, you can take it from that now, go to Google Translate, get English, or get Latin, get English on the right side, type in the word sus, and see pig on that other side. Because the English word sow, sow and sus, same thing. So Jesus, pig. So what's the prefix of that then? I'll leave that one alone for now. So the scripture says in Daniel 7 25, a few verses came to mind as I was researching this out. Daniel 7 25 says, He will speak against the Most High and he comes to To exhaust the Holy Ones of the Most High, he will attempt to alter seasons and the law. James 4 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who are thou that judges another? And we're speaking without like Yeshua. Genesis 49, verse 10 makes it clear the second shall not depart from Judah, nor will you from between his feet, until Shiloh will come, until unto him shall the gather of the people be. So we're speaking about like a lawgiver, Yeshua is the lawgiver, and we know the Antichrist will seek to come and change times and laws. But guess what? He won't stop there. He will also try to change. Something about the lawgiver, change the name of the lawgiver. He will also try to change the name of the lawgiver, the identity of the lawgiver. So, in changing times and laws and the sacred name, Yeshua of Yeshua, why not change the very name of the lawgiver? Why are we changing these laws so that we worship another deity and not Yeshua? Remember, he wanted Yeshua to bow down and worship him. So if you sure of worship him, he'll come for you to worship him. See the move. See how slick he was. So if I cause all of the world to worship another name, they're really worshiping Asatan, the enemy, the author of that name. Why not? And we fell for it. Because we were ignorant that we already acted. We just didn't know. So now we worship Zeus, the hidden conspiracy that no one wants to talk about. I'm sad to say my colleagues in the industry don't. Because it will mess with the income and the ties and the offering of people leave the church. See, I'm not concerned about that. Yeshua is generally transcribed identically to Jesus in English. It was only when, sorry, you sure was not Yeshua. It was only when the Protestant Bible translates in circa 1600 uh, back to the original languages that a distinction between Jesus and Yeshua was noticed and appeared in English in our Bibles, which created a move against amongst publishers of the Bible to distinguish between Jesus and Yeshua and Joshua. Which you notice in the book of James. What we see in the Bible, Joshua starts to appear. What does Yahushua mean? Sometimes transcribed as English as Yehovah, 
which is really, there's no J here. How can it be Jehovah? Jehovah. How can it be Jehovah? There's no less J. He did it rather than that. It's, it's as though they, they acknowledge it's not the original name, so they're trying to kind of take a tippy toe move towards the tree, but not go the whole way. But to be honest with you, the Hebrews, or the Jews, I would say, the Jews have had their hand in all of this as well, in hiding the name of God away from the general people. In fact, the same mindset that was behind the Vatican is also in jewelry. Taking away the original name of Father and giving you a substitute. So we were given Adonai, but then that renders in English as Lord. So everywhere you see Lord in your Bible, it's not supposed to be there. The name of God is supposed to be there. Lord is a title, not a name. He has given, and everywhere in the Bible says, you shall call upon my name. But then we never see it written in the Bible. Conspiracy, I love talking about conspiracy. So, <clears throat> this is the word Yeshua, is a noun meaning a cry for help, a saving cry for help. That is to say, a shout given when you need or in need of rescue. Together with Yah, the name would then literally mean, uh, mean Yahuwah, that's the correct pronunciation, is saving cry. So Yahuwah is a saving cry. That would be the full extension of what his name means. That is to say, shout to Yahuwah, God, when you're in need of help. In another instance, the Messiah appeared in spirit form and in a vision. We need to pay attention to these texts in the Bible to the Apostle Paul, whose real name was Shaul, by the way, not Paul. They anglicized everyone and everything in the Bible. On the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 7, and spoke in Hebrew. He didn't speak in Chinese or any other language in the world. He spoke to Paul in Hebrew. Paul described what happened. Quote, and when we were, when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Shaul, Shaul, why persecutes thou me? It is not for the king against the prince. So Paul asked this spirit, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am, the Bible preach Jesus, but it's Yeshua, I am Yeshua. Hold up. Yeshua is telling you his name. Go find that anywhere else in scripture. This is one of the few verses we have where he actually says what his name is for himself, not anybody else. Right here is the only place I found in the entire Bible. You'll find him saying, I am that I am. I am the bread I am. He'll say all of that. He'll give him many other references that allude to how the Almighty, the El Shaddai, all of that. But where will we find him saying, I am Yeshua? And here we find it in this verse. He's speaking to Paul in the Hebrew. He didn't speak to Paul in a different language and Paul heard that language and understood it. No, he spoke to Paul in Hebrew. I am Yeshua whom thou persecutest. And he said, I am Yeshua Hebrew. One thing is clear, the sign of his name and as, and as was stated and repeated throughout this presentation, it is impossible for him to have said Jesus as it is transmogrified. Yeshua spoke to Paul in his native tongue, Hebrew. Let's look at some archaeological evidence. In the documentary, Lost Human Jesus, archaeologist Amos Koya, or Koya, started saying sorry, that the name Yeshua was then a popular form of the name Yahushua, and was one of the most, one of the common names in the time of the Second Temple. As you know, there was another man named Yeshua uh, who was standing trial with Yeshua. Uh, in discussing whether it was remarkable to find a tomb with the name Yeshua. The particular ossuary in question bears the inscription Yahuda Bar Yeshua. He pointed out that the name had been found 71 times in burial caves from that period. Thus, both the full form Yahushua, or Yahushua, which it should be right here, and the abbreviated form Yeshua were in use during the Gospel period and in relation to the same person. As in the Hebrew Bible references to Yahushua, son of or Yeshua, son of God, and Yahushua, strong Yeshua, the high priest, the days of Ezra. So, in other words, these were common names. Many other people have the name 
Yahushua or Yeshua. An argument in favor of the Hebrew reduced form, which is what I'm saying today, Yeshua, as opposed to Yeshua, is the West Syriac dialect in which the pronunciation is Yeshu. Right, and this is by something that you put in the presentation. As I said before, in the Greek language there were many different forms of Greek. You've heard of Aramaic, but guess what? Aramaic is a group of many different types of Middle Eastern languages. But it's really, some of the languages more dialects, not languages. So if you were to go to West Syria, East Syria, Galilee, Tiberius area, they would speak different forms of Aramaic, but the spelling would look identically the same pretty much. Its form would slightly shift, but the same letters would appear. In the Phoenician dialect, you would see the same letters appear. I'll, I'll show you some of that later on so you can see that when translating Aramaic to Hebrew, it's a very simple shift. Very simple shift. Nothing is lost. The meaning, not just the spelling, the meaning is retained. So, uh, Talon's Let's Get a Second Temple Period names are uh, inscription in Palestine that uh, includes for Yeshua, or sorry, Joshua, 85 examples of Hebrew, Yeshua, 15 of Yahushua, and 48 examples of Isus in Greek inscriptions, with only one Greek variant as Isua. One ostrary, which is basically a, like a castle, it's a tomb, um, what do you call a coffin, basically, and what they would put the bones and the body, the body uh, and deceased into. Uh, one ostrary of around 20, uh, one ostrary of around 20, known with the name Yeshua. Reminding of the nine discovered by Ezra uh, Sunni in uh, 1931, has Yeshu, uh, Yeshu and Yeshua Ben Yosef, Yeshua son of Joseph. Yeshu may have been scratched out. But two Jewish magical incantation bowls have been discovered, both bearing various spellings of Yeshua. So we're clearing up it was a very common name all over Israel. They could have just taken that name straight over. So you have an option. You can go to a foreign country and change their language to be yours. Or you can go to a foreign country and take the names that they call people or whatever and bring it over into yours. You don't have to translate it, just say it. So, Pierre in France, France, when he comes over here, you can still call him Pierre. But if you want to change it to Peter, it's your choice. But his name is Pierre. You can take it as it is and learn to say it as it is. And that's what should happen with Yeshua. Bring the name over as it is. Don't change it according to your grammar at the time. What's happened is the language and the grammar and the spelling and the pronunciation over a hundred, few hundred years has changed. So no, this is, this is my own words. It was always fascinating to me that Bible translators had no problem translating Hallelujah, praise be to Yah, but Yeshua, they couldn't do that. So they take what they want and leave off of it. Remember, I said about an agenda to remove everything Hebrew and Jewish out of Scripture. So remember, when Paul and Silas went to Elisha, they were received, and the people loved them, and accepted their message gladly. But then, just when Paul and Silas were smiling at each other, about to celebrate and praise God for what had been done, and the people received the message, the people then turned and said, This is Zeus, Barnabas, and not the Paul, because he did all the talking. That's Hermes, the messenger. The apostles said, No, don't worship those gods or us, thinking we are manifestations come down to earth from Olympus. No. And the people after being wild up uh, and liberated by Jews coming from Antioch and Iconium turned upon the apostles to kill only the messenger, Paul. Because they wouldn't touch Barnabas because he's standing in the position of Zeus. You don't mess with Zeus, but they'll kill the messenger. Um, it's interesting there that I find again, as long as they're coming in a form that they believe that they accepted God's coming down as human beings. They have no problem with that. And they were ready to accept him and say, yeah, you, you, your, your message is one of Zeus. But the minute he's coming with another message that they say, no, we're not coming in the name of Zeus, we're not coming in the name of your gods, they were willing to accept that. Just pause the thought. There is only one name on the heaven which men should worship, and 
um, food. I like the fact that Paul and Barnabas, they stood up for what they believed and didn't acquiesce. Because let me put it another way. Have you not heard this? Your God is the same as my God. There's a different name. That's where I'm coming from with this. We can all worship the same God. It's the same God, it's a different name. You call it Yahweh, you call it Allah. One God. So for years at AT&T and Android, we have global, what's it called, um, global prayer rooms and uh, team spirit and all of these different popular names. To basically say, all these different religions are all one God, the same God, with different names. We can all live in peace. No, we can't live in peace. We'll never live in peace. Never. If you go to the Dome of the Rock, at the very top of the Dome of the Rock in Israel, with an inscription written around, Allah has no son. Allah has no son. But we, our whole faith is based upon not having a son. In fact, it's really contradictory because above is the inscription and beneath is the rock. You know what the rock's called? The rock is called Aven. Aven is Av and Ben, Father, Son. What a contradiction! Father has a son. The scripture is telling you this from the Old Testament right the way through. So let's look at some quotations from the Far East. Let's move beyond me. Let's look and see what we see out there in the big battle. So in the Encyclopedia Americana, originally the name of the Messiah was pronounced Yahushua. That there is symbols. Or Yahushua. This is the Messiah's original name. The Messiah's name is actually the same name as Joshua, son of Nun, correctly pronounced Yahushua. It is quite evident that the modern form of Jesus doesn't even remotely resemble the original name that the disciples used. This is a fact. Jesus Christ, Matthew 121 interprets the name originally as Yahushua, Yahushua that is, Yehovah is salvation. That's an encyclopedia. You get more truth out of an encyclopedia than the church pulpit. The name Jesus, this is taken from uh, Baruch Ben Daniel, organizer. The name Jesus is not a derivative, it's not a derivative. Of Yahweh or Yahweh. There is great cause for alarm when this hybrid Greek name is being piled, piled sorry, onto the Messiah because not only is it not the sanctified in the name of Yeshua or Yahshua, but prophetic and sanctified unity within the word of Yahweh is lost. Early Christo pagans synchronized Greek culture into Greek Christianity, which smoothed the way for Christo paganism. Christopaganism to become the state religion. So what we're practicing is Christo or Christo paganism. That would be a better name for what's practicing churches now. The origin of Christianity by Amy Trevor. They, the Greco Roman world, had worshipped Zeus as a supreme deity. They saved him with Zeus, so now they were ready to accept the Hashua as Jesus or Isus. Meaning, hail Zeus. So Jesus means hail Zeus. It's the word hail in its original context means no. The term was where do you hail from? So hail Zeus comes from Zeus. So every time we worship Jesus, that's what we're really saying. Now our time in the scriptures say that uh, Yahweh or Yahweh or the Holy Son's name is Jesus. Which is a compound word made up of E and Zeus. Isus. Hail Zeus. This name of the true Messiah, Joshua, is really Yahushua, being Hebrew, was objectionable, objectionable to the Greeks and Romans, who hated the Judeans, Jews. And so it was deleted from the records, and a new name inserted. Yahushua was thus replaced by Isus. Hail Zeus. Now known to us as Jesus. Let's look at what was the church trying to hide by Tommy Rushman. In 1415, the Church of Rome took an extraordinary step to destroy all knowledge of two of the two second or second century Jewish books. Two second century Jewish books that oh sorry, two second century Jewish books. There were two second century Jewish books. They took all set to destroy that it said contained the true name of Christ. That's what the Vatican Church really does. 
They're not here to try to teach you anything about the truth. They're here to try to obscure the truth and give you their new Christ of paganism. This week, Father said to me, just, just flip over to ET, EWTL, which is the Catholic channel. So I flipped over because I was watching it. And I was looking at this mass and I'm thinking, there's something here Father wants me to see about this mass. And I've seen many masses, but I've never ever seen the, the mass of the, the Holy Eucharist done with the all seeing eye pyramid in the cross. And I was like, whoa, we've got to hold the level here now. When they now have the whole mass taking place, but they have the Illuminati pyramid at the back and the front of the cross, and the Eucharist is in the middle of the triangle, and they open the triangle to take out the Eucharist, and that's what they feed the people. Now, anyway, why would we deal with that? And that's wrong with the Father's before you. The plan of the Greeks was simple. They nearly dropped the Hebrew terminology of the names, which referred to the Hebrew deity, and substituted the name or letters referring to the name of the supreme deity, Zeus, as in Faith Magazine, volume 69. Gospel of the Kingdom, three names are titled by Dr. Henry Clifford Kennedy. It is simply amazing to think that all these years, hundreds of years, Mankind has been calling the Savior by the wrong name. It's hard to give up the name of Jesus because it's so deeply ingrained in us and much has been said and done in that name. I grew up in it. I got baptized in the name of Jesus. But you have to get to a point where you say, Father, all of this is truth. It's fact. It's not in religion. It's history. What do we now do? But well, we read it at the very beginning. Repent. Repent. Repent of it, and you will fall, you turn. Let's go to Pontius Pilate. Yeah. Pontius Pilate wrote the name of the Messiah in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Above his head on the cross, when the Messiah was crucified, Luke wrote the following. An inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. Traditionally, most crucifixes, the special Roman Catholic, have the Latin initials of the Messiah as follows I N R I, which means Isus Nazarenus Rex King uh, Idumean. So, King of the Idumean, so Idumean. No, there is no J. This is Latin now, for it did not exist at this time. This is translated into English and means Jesus, now of the Jews. So, even in the Bible, there's no J, so how can it be Jesus? He didn't write that. This is, this is the governor of all Judea. It's been glaring us, it's been staring us in the face. The French philosopher and historian and religious scholar Ernest Renan, or Renan, stated in his book, The Life of Jesus, that the Savior was never called Jesus in his lifetime. Renan based his conclusion on his archaeological trips to the Holy Land in searching for inspiration and materials on the Savior. It goes on. It was known, this is Dictionary of, Christ, Dictionary of Christian Law and Legend by Professor Jason J. Metford. It is known that the Greek name ending with Zeus, or Zeus and Zeus, were attached by the Greeks to names and geographical areas as a means to give honor to the supreme deity of Zeus. So tomorrow morning, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go to church and worship Zeus. In ignorance, not knowingly, in ignorance do they worship me. We ever read that before? So, you may not be at the front of the church as a statue, but you might as well be because the veneration is going up to hail Zeus. That's what it means. Yeshua or Jesus, which biblical research institutes. Some authorities who have spent their entire lives studying the origins of names believe that Jesus actually means Hail Zeus. For Jesus uh, in Greek is Hail Zeus, and E translates to Hail, and Zeus or Sus translates as Zeus. The English name Jesus or Jesus therefore stands etymologically from Jupiter Zeus, the chief god of the ancient Greek Olympus. I'm going to carry on, so I'm going to keep banging the stairs of the wood. Winds of praise. Jesus is a transliteration of a Latin name 
Jesus, pronounced by Jesus, which means nothing in Hebrew, but in Latin it means Jesus. If Yeshua's name had been translated into our language, it would have been closer to Joshua or Yahushua. Edwin Harlow. It is interesting to note that throughout his life, Christ never did hear himself be called by that name, Jesus. That's great invention. Come out of here, my people, by C.J. Costa. Research reveals that the name Jesus is linked to the Greek sun god Zeus. So it's obvious they know that they're in the academic world. They all know. Story of the Christian Church. Wilbert, this new church adopted various deities from the heathen and discarded the Most High, Yahuwah, of the Israelite scriptures. And they also discarded his blessed son, Yahshua. Jesus was Jesus that Jesus, that was the name given to him by the early church, many years after his death. They wanted to remove any Jewishness from the new church. They eliminated his Jewish name and blended his name, the name of Zeus, into the Christian church to make it comfortable for all those who previously worshipped the Greek and Roman gods. It made it easier for the pagans to become Christians. Since Zeus was the top god of their experience, attaching the name Jesus to Yeshua gave him top priority in the worship hierarchy. You see how it all makes sense now. See the psychology. Satan is a psychologist. He knows how to win the minds of the people. Our Christianity again. The pagans of Greece and Rome had worshipped Zeus as a supreme deity. They said it was Zeus. So now they were eager to accept Jesus as Jesus or Zeus as their savior. Not a problem. So the church simply gave the people, the pagans, what they were already familiar with, what would be palatable. But we read about Arabius that when Paul came with this new name and this Hebrew teaching was also new, the High Council said we've got to take some time out. So we know about a great many teachings, that's all we do, but this is new to us. So the problem that the church has now with the name Yeshua is new. And it doesn't carry the same weight for them as Jesus. Jesus is holy. For many of them, they think Yeshua, okay, we can maybe you said that was his name there, but Jesus is the name that is given to the church. That's the holy name. So we see. Now, our modern translated scriptures say Christ's name is Jesus. The name Jesus is a compound word made of obedience to his or origin of Christianity. How did nice Jewish church, how did the nice Jewish church become Gentile? Now the church had behind it the full power of the Roman Empire. Any sect would be looked upon as criminal. From this point on, the sword of the empire and not the sword of the spirit would determine church doctrine and practice. Israel was cast aside, and the church officially became the tool of Rome. If you worshipped any form of deity outside of the recognized Greek god pantheon, or the names now that they were given, in other words, Jesus, you would be killed. You would be killed. How did the last Jewish church become Gentile again? The triumphalist, the triumph, the triumph, the triumphalist church of Constantine was now effectively cut off, and now effectively cut off its Jewish roots. It would receive its sustenance from Greco Roman and Pentecostal culture around it. It could no longer be truly biblically based. It could no longer be truly biblically based. The trend would continue to modern. Times. I'm sure many of you have had Bible studies with people from different denominations and even Catholic church members. And have you got to that point where you realize we're not actually even looking at the scriptures right now? You're just talking about what your denomination believes, but show me that in the Bible. And that's where we're living in the day where people will no longer suffer sound doctrine in the Bible says. But they will keep up to themselves their own beliefs. Roman authorities viewed the spread of Judaism as a threat to Rome. The traditional Christian church has forgotten and even rejected her Jewish roots. Later, in a similar manner, Pope Alexander VI ordered all copies 
of the Jewish Talmud destroyed, the Council of the Inquisition required as many Jewish writings as possible to be burned. Why? Because they had the name in there of Yeshua or Yahushua, the real name. So now, what they're trying to do is really take it to the Dark Ages, where all you know is what they're torching, not the truth. And we're kind of still there. The mass destruction of Jewish books included hundreds of copies of the Old Testament, and in an attempt by the church to remove rabbinic information about Messiah, really, from the face of the earth, the Inquisition burnt 12,000 volumes of the Talmud. That's Tommy Bush's book, what was the church trying to hide the book. In the mass destruction of Jewish writings, the church had to destroy all documents that recorded the true name of Mishnah. The Talmud evidence indicates that historically, the Jews regarded the name of the Messiah as Yahushua, Yahushua. The Romans made Christianity their state religion. And shortly after the apostle died, the Romans broke Christianity to a great degree by destroying Christ's connections to Judaism and replacing them with pagan religious teachings of our days. Correctories or correctors were hired to alter the Bible in thousands, not tens, not hundreds, thousands of places in an attempt to distance Christ from his Jewish heritage. Did you hear that? The name of Yehovah was replaced with or by Lord or God. So all of those places you see Lord and God is supposed to be his name. <clears throat> Other scriptures were also deleted, added, or altered in order to support the new state religion that was from the same book. Did you take it on board? It's not good. It's not good. See, I really believe that Father's hand has been upon Scripture to retain what we have. But man's hand has also been at the printing presses, controlling those printing presses. I know we're in the last days because if Father had not preserved what we have, there'd be no hope for us. There'd be no hope. And in all of this, the message of salvation is still there. The message of hope and love is still there. The prophecies of the second coming and how we'll be coming and the feasts and the replacement of Israel for the church is all there. We know we have to be engrafted into Israel. It's for Father to retain all the essential information. But still, mankind is even working now to move that out. So you know already there are Bibles that exist with no Old Testament. There are Bibles that exist that change he to a she. We have the King James, we also now have the Queen James. You know that? Yeah. Do you research on what Bibles exist? And they are now politically correcting the Bible. I mean, why have it as a he? Why have it as a she? Take out all the references that speak against homosexuality as well. All that's already been done. We now have so many different versions of the Bible. Pick one that fits your lifestyle. Jesus loves you. That's how it's packaged. That's how it's packaged. So I have a friend of mine, Carlton McDonald, who does a great presentation on Bible versions. And words are being taken out. Whole chunks are being taken out of the Bible. All the years. That's how they do it. Gradually phase again. So 20, 30, 40 years from now, what will our children be reading in the Bible? What will they really know that's biblically sound doctrine? What will they have changed? Let's skip some slides here. We've read this one earlier on. There is no other name given under heaven that by men can be saved. The face of Jesus is an ever changing face, it's constantly evolving, but it always rotates around a particular people group, a particular look, a particular even sexual orientation. There's a deliberate move to have a face that we can identify that looks 
male but also female in many parts. And there's a reason why the face of Jesus has been changing over the years. He said in John 5, when she was speaking, I have come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If a never shall come in his own name, him he will receive. And I find his words so true. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressed, it speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed the hot iron. Nowadays, I find that when I go to certain conferences, when I go to sing at certain uh, meetings, I'm really surprised at what I see out there as Christians. The piercings and the tattooings and the tribal markings. I'm like, this wasn't what we call being born again. This is not what I really see as a renewed life. And many of these tattoos, piercings, and boltings are coming on after they are born again, not before. And it's supposed to be cool. Whereas one time the word said, the word still says to me, your body is holy, put no markings and no piercings in it. Because your flesh is holy to God. We teach it, we don't teach that anymore in churches. So now young people are coming in and they're coming in after they're born again, and they're also called born again. And all kinds of tribal occult, occult earrings are going in their ears, nose, cheek, under the eye, wherever. But I'm saying this to say that no wonder is holiness a part of the teaching in churches. I don't know about you, but I've seen a very good version out there. Now we make all things acceptable that weren't once acceptable. This is the common place that we all have recognized and accept as the biblical Jesus or the Jesus that we've grown up with in our walls and parts of the wall. Very similar rendition to Zeus. Do you think it's possible that when they were thinking of an image for Jesus that he had to look like the gods of most of Europe, the pagan god Zeus? This man here is Cicero Borgia, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. He also painted this version of, this is what Jesus would look like. This is a Pope's son, Pope Alexander VI. His royalty, extremely powerful, also homosexual, openly. He and Leonardo were having a homosexual relationship. Out of his love for Cesare Borgia, Leonardo da Vinci created this image. He was actually in competition with Michelangelo to see who would create the image of the Christ, the acceptable image of the Christ. And this was the image that pleased Alexander, uh, sorry, Pope, Pope, who was his father. So this became the official image. But notice this very feminine form, because there were open homosexual. And this is the image that many of us have grown up with as Christ. Cesare Borgia is in the book entitled Triptych of Poisoners. And also in the book entitled Cesare Borgia is Life and Times by Sarah Bradford. Between 1502 and 1503, he employed Leonardo da Vinci as a military architect and engineer, in which he and Leonardo da Vinci became intimate instantaneously. They were lovers. To express his love towards Cesare, Leonardo painted many pictures of him. Cesare's father, Rodrigo Borgia, then became Pope Alexander VI, under the authority of the Catholic Church, beliefs had his own son's image branded as Jesus Christ for the Western world. Cesar had sex with his own sister, Lucrezia, and he killed his brother, Giovanni, in 1497. And this is the man whom the Catholic Church gave their consent to allow his picture to be put up and portrayed as Jesus Christ. To deceive the whole world to think Christ was European. Seeing what most people don't know is there was a competition during the time between the Renaissance period, between the Leonardo da Vinci and the Leonardo Michelangelo. The competition was to see who could impress the king by, make, by making a new image of the king's son that would deceive the world, in which the Leonardo da Vinci, da Vinci won the competition. See, all of that would make myself a chair. I don't know how you feel when seeing something like that. 
But this is what we have. My mom used to have all the pictures on the walls. And it's, ugh. And this is what we grow up with. So I'm sharing all this information with you so that you would be informed and that you would wake up on this. Don't keep it to yourself. Go back and tell mom. Go back and tell us this. Come and speak this. Share this information with others. It's important for them to know all this. I mentioned before about Aramaic. That's what we need to touch on that. The term Aramaic meaning the language of the Arameans. You know that Abraham was an Aramean? It's actually in the King James Bible. He was a wandering Aramean, the Bible says. We get that. We call the word the part of the country where the Arameans come from. We now call Syria and part of Iraq as well. That was ancient Aram. Um, Aaron is used as the proper name of several people in the Torah, in uh, the sentences of Shem. Ancient Aaron, bordering northern Israel and now full city of Syria, uh, Syria, is considered the linguistic epicenter of Aramaic, the language of the Aramaeans who settled the area during the Bronze Age, 3500 BC. There is some confusion about the origin of the language. Often the statements have originated within Assyria. In fact, Aramaeans carried their language and writing into Mesopotamia by voluntary migration, by forced exile of concrete armies, and by nomadic Chaldean invasions of Babylon. Interestingly, the Christian primary text written in Koine Greek, New Testament, translates the word Hebrew as Aramaic. Part of this confusion is contributed by Greek meaning, Greek naming Aram, Syria, in Acts 15:41. Galatians 1.21, and at the same time, calling Assyria, Iraq, Syria. So there's all the confusion there. Why am I showing all this with you now? In a study of Aramaic, you will find Aramaic, Hebrew, comparisons carrying straight over letter to letter to create clean translation, easily made. Not so with other languages. It's interesting to me that when I look at antiquity, this language that they call Aramaic seems to go so far back. Remember the Bible said the whole world spoke one language? That's why I'm bringing this to you. So when you're doing your studies, keep this in mind as you're doing your digging. You will probably find that ancient language that the whole world once spoke, that all men spoke, and had all things in common, Aramaic. I'll leave that one there. So, let me see this slide. I'll see this one as well, because it's, it's good stuff, because it talks about in Genesis 31, remember when Laban and Jacob parted ways? It says, And Jacob said to his kinsmen, Gather some stones, and they took stones, and made a part of them, and ate there by the pile of stones. And Laban called it Yadar Sahodunta, pile of witness, in Aramaic, while Yadar called it Gal Ed. Father the witness, they the same thing in Hebrew. So the meaning is still the same, but the way they pronounce it and spell it is different, but the meaning is still the same. But I'm trying to tell you that Aramaic and Hebrew, though they're very close, are still different languages. But listen, that's just what the, the issue was. I'll speak that as a translation time. We get to this. What's in a name? I love this part. Many of you will see this letter and you know what it is to right away. It's a shin. What's in a name? The letter shin is an awesome and extremely powerful letter. You'll see this on most of the Zeus's. By this one symbol alone, that the Zeus was complete. Without the shin, the Zeus is incomplete. That symbol, that letter, says one thing in itself God and love. In fact, Yahweh, God. The letter she is composed of three times seven in its Hebrew meaning. So starting from the Aleph, it's a Zion, then a Nun, then a Shin. The meaning of the Aleph, starting from there, is strength of the leader. In the seventh letter, sword of the spirit. Fourteen, life, or fish, or sperm, seed. Twenty-one, Power to consume. So all of that is in one letter. If 
if you're looking at it from its tail in the context, now we should be going from right to left, but we're going to go from left to right this after this chart is done. There's your Aleph, the symbol of the arts, strength of the leader. Seventh letter, Zanye, which would be a sword or a weapon, plow or a weapon to cut off. Then the Noon would be the symbol of the sea or a fish, symbolizing life. Then the Shin, that name is pale of Hebrew form, looks like teeth. And what do you do with teeth? You chew, you mash down, you break down, restore the food so you consume it. So to eat, to consume, or destroy, that's what the ship symbolizes. Here we have the paleo, then we have the pictal um, Hebrew, paleo Hebrew, biblical Hebrew and English. Here are the letters, so it would be yod, he, vav, he, would be the tetragrammaton for the other one. For the other one, as you said, many people have finished using it. I'm saying that for a while because they have discovered that the Hebrews that were taken out of the diaspora across to the Americas who were never subjected to the Masoretic Hebrew that we know today, this Hebrew, so they were never exposed to the modern Hebrew, the Jewish or the Hebrews that were taken out to the Americas, they were recorded as saying the name of Yah is Yahuwah. They don't have the Masoretic vowel system. So the way they will pronounce it is Yahuwa. And the Cherokee Indians still say Yahuwa. So that's the ancient way of saying the name of the Father. So seven is a number of perfection, completeness, and wholeness. Coincidentally, the word Ruach, Elohim, Spirit of God, equals 300. So the word power coming out of the Shin is a word of power and victory. Shin is to consume. Its symbol is teeth. Fire of God. The Bible says, Our God is a consuming fire. God is an all consuming fire. Shin is the only letter of God that is connected to God by itself. No other letter in the Hebrew language represents God all by itself. Why so much emphasis on just a letter? Sure, it's not that important. It was the word that appeared to Israel. Sinai. And to the apostles in the King James uh, rendering as tongues of fire that divided. Does this look like tongues that could divide? And also the, the rabbinical writings about what happened at Mount Sinai was everyone saw words appear. Just like the apostles said they saw cloven tongues of fire that came down and divided over everyone's head. It looks like tongues. Tongues. It looks like, is that like tongues, possibly? This is what the Hebrews write. This is what they said that the, the ancient Hebrews saw as an outside. So, where do we see this shin? Well, Shaddai is the one that has the shin at the beginning of it, which means Almighty God. It's root is Shaddai. Shaddai means fire of God who destroys the spoil. So, God will spoil your enemies for you. That's him. He will spoil and destroy it for you. Shalom, where's his shin again? Peace and perfection and blessedness. Shema, here. Um, and Shema, Yahweh. So Yahweh Shema. Yahweh is there or here. Shabbat, where's his shin again? Perfect rest and restoration. This one I'm wearing around my neck has a double shin in there. It's called the Shomreshim. It's the symbol of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Together as one, that the priesthood we wear. Three bars is what you see in the shin. Three bars with a yod at the top. It's, uh, in 2 Chronicles 6 6, Father speaking, saying, I have chosen Yaru Sha Layim that I might put my name there. I learned that when Father speaks, he's usually literal. It's for us to go and search it out. Isn't that Bible text? It's the glory of God to conceal the matter, and the honor of the word of King to search it out. More shims. Shimot, Exodus, bring sheet, ho shia, yeshu yahu, yahu, the Israel, I just have a sheet at the beginning. Yeremiah yahu, yahu, he put his name in the middle of these words. Yahushua, yahuda, shofim, shamuel, 
not necessarily the whole name of God. Shorim Barashem, Asherim, some of songs. So throughout the scripture, he keeps putting these shins in these words, or putting his name, Yah, in the midst of these words. What's he trying to say to us? This picture is held in the Library of Congress. Believe me, the governments know stuff. They just don't tell us about it. Do you see a shin anywhere in there? Do you see a shin? This is a, a topographical picture of the land of Jerusalem. So just the area, not the land of the city of Jerusalem, encompasses all of this. And just here, this is the Kidron Valley. This is where the city of David is, three of beyond. We have the Kidron Valley, the Tarakon Valley, and the Valley of Hinnom. Forms a perfect ship right around and right through the city of Jerusalem. Literally fulfilling what Father said here I have chosen Yerusha Layim to put my name there. He literally stands, and the whole land is formed, or the city is formed, built on one huge shin. Isn't that amazing? If someone told me that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it unless you see it with your own eyes. But there, topographical map, you can see the shin formed by the three valleys. Three, not four, not five, but three valleys. There you see it again. The temple would have been right here. Temple grounds, the gates of Benjamin, the royal palace, Herod's palace, the springs of Gion is a palace tunnel. David's Palestine, Kulusari, all these key figures. Did you know your heart? <laughs> it shouldn't surprise you. Who made you after all? If he puts his name in a city, is it possible he might put his name in you? Didn't the Bible say you were made after his own image? So there, man. These are the walls of your heart. You've got the two magic walls, the two parts, but then you've got the three walls that form a shin. Check all this out. Go home tonight. Type in open hearts. Take a look at the computer. Get your encyclopedia out. You're going to see the shin right there in the human heart, forming the walls, three walls of your heart. Is this by coincidence? Or do you think it's by design? I love Father. So Paul addresses the Arab knights at Mars Hill. They said the times and the times of this ignorance he went God wins. But at uh, wait at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I can't stress enough. Different times, same situation. We are in the same place, but we have been saturated with every kind of teaching known to man, except for the, the whole truth. And we now have to sit down and say, Father, we repent of all that we've learned and acquired. Now we will make a conscious decision to take the form, or take the name, and take the truth you've given to us, and we will walk in it. Closing up. I appreciate your patience. It's, it is the word of God, I still think about the honor of the kings to search the house. Proverbs 25, verse 2, for those of you who keep notes. Numbers 6, verse 20 through 27. Put my name upon Israel through the Shalom. 2 Kings 21, verse 4. It makes it clear. He will put his name in Yerushalayim. 1 Kings 11, verse 36. He has chosen this place to have Yahweh's name in there. These are my notes. I'm just giving you my real quick. I ran out of time to the presentation finish. Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Shema even has his name in the midst of the Shema. Three, we have three valleys. We have three mountains. Moriah, Ophel, and Zion. That's interesting. Moriah means to the scene of God. Ophel, my fortress or uh, tower or stronghold. Zion, the mark or the seal of the Hebrew cartoon, sign or pillar. In other words, Shin is Father's seal. It's Father's mark on his people. So when he says, I'll put my name upon you, that's the mark of God. The Kotem Elohim is called. Seal of God on me. 
So when we take on his name, Yeshua, and we call upon the name Yeshua, guess what? We're saying to the Father, we have your mark upon us. I belong to you. When we reject that name for another, well, we're obviously saying that we don't bear your name. The bridegroom is coming for a bride that has his name. Luke 19, 37, 40. The rocks will cry out. The city bears his name. In other words, I said to you, I'm sorry, I may have said it to some of group of you inside there. The rock, in fact, I said to you all, the rock in the dome of the rock is called Event, Father's Son. You know the pastor text where he says, what is his name or what is his son's name without me tell? That's the one verse in the Bible that you don't ever read. They told me, skip that verse. Because it tells them that the Father has a son and the Son has a name. Well, they refute that. We are not that ignorant. We are walking with the power and the authority of the all consuming power of God. We are the ones walking with his name. The very rocks of Yerushalayim will cry out his name. That's why it's called Yerushalayim. So if we fail to cry out his name, so if the rocks will cry out my name, because I call the city Yerushalayim. Isaiah 43, 6 7, call forth all who bears his name. Isaiah 43, verse 6 7, he will call forth all who bear his name. 2 Chronicles 7 14, then if my people who are called by my name, we read these verses, will humble themselves and pray. Come close to the end now. Last one. Matthew 23, 39, for I said unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's all there, 1938 of Luke, saying, Blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. John 12, 12. On the morrow, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Rishalayim, took the branches of the palm tree and went forth to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Yah, even the King of Israel. Folks, how do we do this?